Welcome to this special series of in-depth political interviews that we're doing with Christians from the major political parties standing in this year's general election that takes place on Thursday the 8th of June. And in today's programme, we're interviewing David Curtin, representing UKIP. David, welcome to this special series of interviews we're doing on the general election. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. It's good, it's good to have the opportunity to, to interview again. Um, David, um, your faith plays a big part in your politics, mm. but can you sh sh demonstrate how your faith has had an impact um, on the work that you're doing in education and also mm. the important work you're doing in the London Assembly for UKIP? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, faith has a great part to play uh, in politics in general. I mean, our whole country is founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And, you know, uh, I think, you know, our society uh, is, is part of our society. So I think we want to make sure that the society is fair, uh, that, you know, workers get a good wage. And one thing that I do a lot of on the London Assembly is support black cab drivers. And, you know, there's a situation in London at the moment uh, with Uber, the big company that's come in from America, sort of going all around the world. And there's a lot of concerns about, you know, what they're doing and their business model, um, being registered for tax in the Netherlands, and, and perhaps, you know, driving unfair competition to ordinary working people. So, you know, we, we want to support small businesses, working people, people who, could, who want to stand on their own two feet and make a living for themselves rather than, you know, having a, a big corporation coming in uh, and, you know, changing the playing field, if you like. Nothing against big business at all, but, you know, they have to play fairly. And I think when we see that happening, uh, we've got to stand up against it and make sure that everyone gets a fair deal in this country. And David, you're, you're very much a committed Christian, so, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, obviously God's given you a heart to, for politics, uh, so why did you choose uh, UKIP as a political party? Well, I did have concerns about the European Union and what it was becoming and, and what it is. Um, I joined UKIP in, in 2012, it was about five years ago, and one of the big concerns I had was something called TTIP. Um, I was concerned anyway about the European Union being anti-democratic, taking power away from people in this country uh, so that power was passing from Westminster to Brussels. TTIP would have been this huge trade deal uh, between the EU and the USA which would have given a level of power to corporate courts uh, over and above the EU even and, and that would have had perhaps devastating effects on our health service, uh, on, on businesses uh, and on our democracy uh, and so I thought you know as a Christian using Christian principles I've got to stand up for that and make sure that you know people um, don't get a fair deal, uh, well do get a fair deal and aren't, uh, you know, power isn't taken away uh, from people. This year's general election has pretty been much dubbed the Brexit election and mm. a lot of credit has to go to your former leader uh, Nigel Farage mm. and also UKIP um, mm. for securing the British people this uh, referendum on our mm. EU membership and, and now that the British people have voted to leave UKIP can be very proud of your achievements mm. regarding this. Um, what do you think your party's legacy is in terms of Brexit and what are your policies moving mm. forward to ensure that we do guarantee mm. our exit from the European Union. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's not just about Brexit, but it is going to be the most important issue in this election. And as you say, rightly so, um, the referendum wouldn't have happened without UKIP. Uh, it's fought for this um, for 24 years, and, and everyone in UKIP who's been involved can be very, very proud of the achievements of the party. But it's not over yet. It, we're not out of the EU. Uh, we've still got another two years at least of negotiating uh, through the Article 50 Treaty. So we need to make sure that we have a full Brexit, a clean Brexit, one that we're not uh, stuck with one foot in the door, shackled to uh, the European courts or European directives or the single market, that we're fully out and we're free uh, to make our own trade deals around the world, to make our own laws, um, that we stop giving money to the, the EU, which could be spent on public services here, uh, and so on. Um, so, so that's a very important thing. But there are other things that UKIP has got to do as well that I think we've always... 
uh, done and spoken out for. But obviously, the EU coming out has been one of the, the main things. We always also talk about immigration um, and the effects of uh, rapid immigration uh, on, on the country uh, and people who live here uh, in terms of you know, affecting housing, house prices, in terms of affecting wages and public services. You know, it, it's not good for people who live here to have rapid immigration. It's not good for people who come uh, as migrants as well, who think they're coming to a land of milk and honey, but sometimes end up, you know, working in, you know, very, very poorly paid jobs. And, and uh, the, the dream that they have uh, is shattered the moment they come here. So it's, it's not good for anybody. Um, but I think we do need to stand up to the, the growth of Islamism in this country. That's definitely something we've come out and said uh, recently. And, and that's something which is going to be, some, we'll, some, we'll be uh, speaking out on them in the future. Also standing up to some of the worst aspects of political correctness. You know, we hear the NUT calling for sex education in nursery schools. This kind of thing is, you know, as far as I'm concerned, beyond the pale. It shouldn't be happening. You know, two-year-olds should not be, you know, getting sex education when they can hardly eat. It's, <laughs> I don't know what's going through some of these people's minds who seem to be pushing an aggressive political correctness. And I think UKIP is the party to stand up to these kind of things. It's also the kind of, the party to stand up for using the country's money wisely. You know, we see a lot of money being wasted uh, on, on things like HS2 in London, the Garden Bridge, 37 million pounds was spent without a brick being laid. You know, and these kind of things go on and on and on, over and over again. And no one seems to question the misuse of taxpayers' money. Why are we not investing in nurses, accident and emergency units, GPs, schools, and wasting money on, on great schemes which, which never seem to get built? You know, we, we need to be good stewards of the finances and the money that we have. Uh, and David, I think it's fair to say that ever since um, the triumph of uh, last year's referendum, that uh, your party has gone from crisis to crisis. We've had um, your uh, leader, uh, Nigel Farage, uh, step down as, as party leader. Uh, in that time, you've had uh, two leadership contests, as well as your one and only uh, member of parliament actually resigning. Um, and in, in a sense, how relevant is UKIP mm. today, knowing that really you've fulfilled your political aspirations and getting Britain mm. out of the European Union? Well, you know, there's no question it's been a difficult time for us. You know, after the triumph of winning the referendum and being the most successful party, you know, in, in this century, uh, perhaps last century as well together, you know, it, it's been uh, yeah, uh, not uh, expected that, that this would sort of happen after the referendum. It's true, it's, it's been difficult and, you know, not Nigel stood down after three weeks after the referendum. I was there in the, the time when he stood down. I, I, I wasn't expecting it. And then, uh, you know, we have to sort of pick ourselves up and, uh, and move on. And um, we, we've had a couple of leadership contests. Paul Nuttall, who was the, the deputy leader, is now the leader. And uh, he's come at a difficult time. And he's trying to, to put in place, you know, professionalise the party, put systems in place um, w which would allow us to, to move forward and, and fight uh, uh, in an election. Uh, we weren't, you know, the local elections uh, a couple of weeks ago weren't good for us. We didn't expect them to be uh, good because we were going through a difficult time, but we we're hoping, you know, to, to uh, uh, improve, you know, put things in place ready for a general election in 2020. But then, you know, the, the snap election here was called. But I don't think that what happened in the local elections will be repeated uh, in the general election. I'm, I'm full of hope for the general election. I think that people will see uh, in the places where UKIP are standing that uh, a lot of people will actually vote for UKIP in those places to see, you know, giving Theresa May uh, an overwhelming majority uh, could actually be bad for the country, could actually be bad uh, for Brexit. Um, I think we need uh, an opposition and UKIP could be that opposition and, and lots can happen in the last one or two weeks of an election. It did last time, <laughs> completely unexpectedly. I think we're going to see some surprises this time as well. And talk about the issue of uh, leadership, David. I mean, this has been one of the key components so far in this election campaign has been fought over the issue of, of leadership and, and, and it's true that Paul Nuttall doesn't have the same uh, stature as uh, Nigel Farage but do you think he can still convince 
the British public to uh, support him and vote UKIP. Well, well, of course, Nigel is, is you know, an incredible person. He uh, was the leader for nine years or more, and you know, he's, a, he's a national, international figure and now. He's been doing the job uh, for a long time. You know, sometimes you need some time to bed in. And uh, Paul, to be fair, Paul Nuttall has been a leader for a few months, not as, <laughs> anywhere near as long as, as Nigel. He's, he's doing a good job behind the scenes in, in professionalising the party. And, you know, what I would say about Paul Nuttall is he's, far, he's very collegiate. You know, he's, he's uh, uh, appointed lots of spokesmen. I'm one of them. I'm the education spokesman. So, you know, I think what the difference now is that, you know, before the referendum, there was a lot of focus on Nigel, just on, on Nigel Farage, which, which was wonderful before the referendum. He, he was the right man to do that. We're in another phase of our existence now, and uh, having a more collegiate style of leadership, I think, is the right thing for the party at the moment. So you're seeing you know, Peter Whittle, uh, you're seeing me, many other people, uh, Roger Helmer, Tim Aker, other spokesmen uh, are very visible. So uh, there's a difference there, um, but I think it's the right thing for now. Um, one of the big issues that many of our viewers are concerned about is the growing marginalisation of Christians in society, mm. but also the political marginalisation mm. of Christians. Uh, and so many Christians feel fearful in mm. the workplace if they uh, want to share a Bible verse with mm. a work colleague or if they want to pray w w with a sick patient and that fear of being prosecuted and they can lose their jobs. Mm. What plans does UKIP have in place to protect these valuable Christian uh, freedoms? I think we need uh, targeted reform of the Equalities Act and I think we need to stop going down the route of uh, creating ever more crimes for hate speech. These are two specific things that are being done legis legis <laughs> legislatively um, which may be done for good intentions uh, by some people but are having the effect uh, that Christians are being marginalised. You know, uh, I give you an example. I mean, after 9/11, there was the uh, the prevent strategy to combat Islamism. Uh, but some of the you know the the language of extremism is now being used to target Christians. You know, for example, if you support traditional marriage, um, if you know, if you even say there are two biological sexes rather than this new idea that people are pushing on primary schools uh, and, and secondary schools that there, there are 57 genders or whatever. Um, you know, the, these kind of things uh, are being pushed to, and if you don't agree with the current politically correct viewpoint, you're labelled a hate criminal or a xenophobe or a homophobe or a bigot. That's absolutely wrong. I was completely unequivocal about saying that on the day the NUT came out and said we need to start pushing these things in nursery schools. But unfortunately, that was the same day as Theresa May called the uh, general election, so it was lost uh, in the media that day. But uh, UKIP is going to be the party that will stand up against uh, Christians being labelled as hate criminals, against Christians, uh, be, you know, the, the erosion of, of Christian faith in society. Uh, we will stand up against that and make sure that that doesn't continue to happen. Yeah. Just want to discuss now uh, your party's economic policy. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your you proposed, you're supposed to increase spending on the NHS mm -hmm. by three billion, according to news reports, and also defence spending by three billion. Mm -hmm. uh, both of which are, are good ideas. But how will you pay for this extra cost in spending? We will have twenty billion extra from coming out of the European Union, £10 billion pounds a year uh, net we give to the bureaucrats in Brussels in EU membership fees, we'll have that money. Uh, the overseas development uh, budget is £14 billion a year. Uh, what we say is £4 billion of that is good. It goes on water, it goes on uh, medical care, it goes on disaster emergency relief. But £10 billion of that you know, is not good. It's, it's given, we, we give a lot of the overseas development budget to countries which have nuclear weapons programs, space programs, presidential jets. A lot of it is channeled through the World Bank, Don't, not many people know that, the European Development Bank and other things. It ends up in the pockets of millionaire poverty barons and wind farm barons. Ten billion pounds there out of the 14 billion overseas development budget we will spend here at home. That's more than enough to cover three, bi three billion for the NHS, three billion for defence and to have a lot left over as well to invest in schools, in our police, in our border force uh, and social care. 
Uh, in terms of um, education, now this, this, is, this is your brief. Um, uh, what do uh, what are UKIP's plans mm. to um, improve standards, particularly knowing mm. that in the world now, you know, it's now a global village. Mm. We're now having to compete with um, uh, the high tech of Southeast mm. Asia and other countries. How can Britain compete in terms of education and preparing mm. um, uh, our young people? to prepare for mm. the workforce. We're giving them the skills and the knowledge that they need to succeed in this mm. very demanding 21st century. I think what we would say as UKIP is probably unique. Um, we've pursued a one size fits all uh, education system at schools, particularly secondary schools, for the last 50 years. Everyone should go to a comprehensive school. That's the ideology. We would say we need to recognise that different children have different aptitudes. Some are academic, should go to grammar schools. Some have a technical and practical aptitude. We should have technical schools for those kind of children so that they can learn practical and technical skills. You know, we're falling well behind Germany, Eastern European countries in those kind of skills. Uh, other people, you know, don't get anything out of the comprehensive system. 11.5% of 16 to 24 year olds are NEETs not in education, employment or training. Just don't have basic personal and employability school skills when they come out of uh, school at 16. So I think for, for those kind of people who, who the education system completely fails and come out not employable, we just need to make sure that they have basic skills. I, mean, I talked to businesses in London, you know, or as, as part of my work on the London Assembly, they said just say, give me someone uh, who turns up on time uh, who smiles at the customers, uh, who doesn't need to take a Facebook break every five minutes. You know, these are just basic things uh, that aren't being taught. We need different kinds of schools for different kinds of people. We're falling well behind Asian countries in maths and science. We need grammar schools to accelerate people who have an academic aptitude. I, mean, you know, I don't make uh, any apologies for that whatsoever to say that. Uh, we need grammar schools for everyone who has those aptitudes. Technical schools, uh, comprehensive or general schools, homeschooling for some people as well, uh, and specialist schools for people who have talents perhaps in sport and art and, and, uh, and drama and those kind of things. In terms of the um, housing crisis, uh, David, mm. I mean, you're on the London Assembly, mm. uh, you know that there is a big problem of houses uh, available in London and the South East to the extent that it's very difficult for first time mm. buyers to actually get onto the property market and, and fulfil their dreams and aspirations of owning their own home. Mm. Um, what are UKIP's policies to address this major problem? Well, you're right. It, something is very wrong uh, in this country where young people come out of university and you know, they can't even get a room in a flat share these days. They can only get a bed in a room share. And these are graduates you know, in London and the South East. What we would say is that you know, the housing crisis is inextricably linked to immigration. There's no way around it. You know, we've had in London, just in London, the population's gone up by nearly two million in the last 20 years. And that's all, almost entirely due to immigration. Uh, in the country as a whole, six million uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Um, and so we haven't been building enough houses, but you know, we, we've got to look after the green belt uh, as well. We don't want to put people in densely populated uh, housing uh, developments which are bad for people's mental health and, and pile people up like chickens in a battery farm. That, that's wrong. We need to stabilise immigration. We need to stabilise our population so we can plan properly uh, and so that the the level of housing that we're building it just isn't enough to cope with immigration, let alone the natural growth in the population. So there's no two ways around it. Every politician of every party promises to do something about the housing crisis and never has done because uh, immigration is too high. So we would deal with immigration and that will deal with the housing crisis in turn. And how do you plan to deal with immigration? Because obviously it's mm. uh, a huge problem. Mm. It is. And we've got net immigration uh, running around 300,000 now. I mean, half of it's from the EU, half of it's not from the EU. But we do need to, you know, make sure that we have a good system uh, of work visas so people with skills can still come but but the the large movement of unskilled labor 
uh, into this country obviously puts pressure on public services and housing, but it also means that young people in this country uh, aren't trained, you know, and, and find it difficult to get jobs here. You know, as I said before, there, there are 800,000 or more NEETs in this country who could do jobs. Why are we bringing people from Eastern Europe uh, to Britain uh, when there are 800,000 young people unemployed in this country? It, it doesn't make any sense. We also have to deal with, with some of the, the reasons why not non-EU citizens are immigrating, again some of it's good, uh, but you have uh, large family reunions uh, wh which causes pressure on immigration, there's sham marriages haven't been properly dealt with uh, and students overstaying visas after they finish their courses. So there are three things that we need to deal with uh, for non-EU uh, citizens coming to, to this country as well to get immigration in balance. There. Uh David, uh, the issue of security uh, mm. has been one of the major issues of this campaign so far, primarily because uh, Labour's leader Jeremy Corbyn um, has constantly, throughout his political career, um, wanted to scrap our nuclear deterrent mm. uh, trident, uh, even though he's been put under pressure to actually uh, says that his party support trident mm. in uh, in their election manifesto. We're also seeing a decline in the support of NATO, which is mm. part of our Western defense um, mm. uh, protection. Uh, and now we're seeing a resurgent Russia in Eastern Europe against uh, the mm. former states of the Soviet Union. Um, what is your party's position on uh, Trident and also NATO? Well, we need to keep Trident. Uh, we need to stay in NATO. NATO has been the bulwark of our security in Western Europe uh, over the last uh, 70 years. I mean, it's madness to, just, to, to suggest that we will walk away from NATO. We will stay a full and active part uh, of NATO. Uh, we also say we shouldn't be getting involved in wars uh, and military action in the Middle East on a unilateral level. You know, if you're going to get involved in Syria and Libya, for example, in Iraq, you know, that needs to be done with all the parties, you know, the Arab countries, Russia, China, America, European countries, all working together. You, you can't get yourself involved in these quagmires in the Middle East without, uh, you know, a plan for what's going to happen when you finish you, to, to get out of it. You, you can't just go into Libya and leave the country in a total mess. That creates knock-on problems for security in Europe as well, as we've seen uh, over the last um, 15 years. It's been a disaster. Uh, and talking about the issue of uh, security in Europe and also in Britain now, uh, over the last uh, few years we've seen an escalation in the number of ISIS-inspired mm. terrorist attacks in both France and in Germany and in in Belgium as well, and also recently in our own capital in London in March with the Westminster terrorist mm. attack. What is your party doing to confront the rise of Islamic terrorist attacks and terrorism? Mm. Yeah, well, as I say, I mean, we are where we are. I mean, the previous governments have, have gone adventuring in Libya and Syria. We've always said that's the wrong thing, uh, but we are where we are with that. We can't undo the past, um, but we have we have to make sure that we control our borders properly so that we stop ISIS terrorists or anyone that's been linked with them from coming into the country. We also have to make sure that we combat Islamism here in this country. You know, and there's areas which are growing up in this country in places with low integration, you know, parts of Birmingham, parts of East London, Bradford, uh, where you know, we have ghettos with Sharia law, with Sharia courts, and they haven't been dealt with. We had the Trojan horse scandal in Birmingham where radical imams, perhaps linked with Wahhabis and Salafist sects of Islam, Islamism, were trying to you know, radicalize schools and radicalize young people in those schools and propagate more homegrown Islamist terrorists. We need to keep on top of that, and UKIP will do that uh, you know, by, by keeping on with the prevention program and uh, and combating it in schools uh, wherever it happens and also uh, making sure that uh, the funding for these Wahhabi and Salafi mosques uh, from Saudi Arabia and Qatar and other places is cut off. Uh, Dave, one big issue of concern for our, our viewers uh, and certainly a big issue for me is the position of Israel um, mm. in terms of protecting Israel's security mm. concerns um, to confront the rise of the boycott, divestments and sanctions mm. movements that delegitimizes mm. Israel uh, and also then protecting um, Israel's borders from the mm. threat of kind of terrorism as well. What is your party's position and stance on Israel? 
Yeah, absolutely. The no public body, you know, should uh, have any you know, truck with the, the the BDS movement, the boycott, divest, sanction on Israel movement. You know, there's absolutely no question that uh, that should be have any place uh, in any sort of local government, national government, schools, or anything like that. You know, where it's being you know, propagated in, in schools, in universities, we need to to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, they need to be inspected by Ofsted, and that should be closed down. We need to be you know, very very. Um, you know, forthright in saying that we support Israel uh, as a nation and we support uh, the right of Israel to exist and you know it shocks me uh, when I hear uh, politicians from some other parties you know actually uh, talking about you know Israel shouldn't exist I mean th this is uh, really something that uh, you know, shouldn't be uh, said in, in British politics. Uh, and David we're also seeing at the same time in the Middle East the uh the horrendous ethnic cleansing against the Christian populations mm. there to extent that it can be classified mm. as genocide and mm. yet many of our Western leaders, um, particularly in the Western world, are refusing mm. to recognise this as actual mm. genocide. What is UKIP's policies to help protect these ancient Christian communities in the Middle East? It, it is. It, it is a genocide of Christians and, and people seem reticent to stand up and talk about it, but you know the the Christian Church in Syria, for example, is is one of the oldest uh, in the world. You know, going back, you know, un unbroken uh, lineage back to the second century. You know, beautiful uh, services that, that that have been held in some places for uh, eighteen hundred years without a break. Um, it's it's a dreadful thing, and what ISIS is doing in Iraq and Syria, of course, you know, is is just. Um, it is a genocide. We shouldn't have gone in in the first place. As I said earlier, we are where we are. We need to bring this uh, war to a close. We need to do more to make sure that ISIS is defeated and bring peace back to Syria, uh, back to northern Iraq, perhaps working with the Kurds. We may have to work with Russia uh, to do that, you need to, uh, to, to get every... Um, party involved um, so that we, we end this. We need to make safe zones uh, in, in Syria, uh, which we then expand uh, until there's peace in the country. Uh, and we need to protect Christians uh, in those areas. Uh, and finally, uh, David, this is your opportunity to explain to our viewers why they should vote uh, UKIP on Thursday, mm. the 8th of June. OK, well, I, as, as we said earlier, this election is mostly going to be about Brexit. I think if you want uh, a full and clean Brexit, where UKIP are standing, vote for UKIP, because we're standing in places where there's no chance of letting in a Remainer MP. So it's safe to vote for UKIP where we are standing, and uh, we are going to make sure you know, that uh, our Judeo-Christian uh, culture and heritage is respected uh, and built on and cherished. Uh, in years to come. David Curtin, I want to thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to interview today, to know where your party stands on the key issues for this general election. Thank you.